Hi, I'm Joel Papadix. You know that moment on a foggy day when the sun just starts to break through and you're seeing this little warm glow in the sky, but stuff is still kind of misty and in the distance? That's the kind of painting we're going to do today. Today's subject is fairly easy. It's a long pier with some working po boats and it's from Tremont, Mount Desert Island. It's up in Maine on the coast. It's a beautiful place. And the effect, this particular effect, reminds me of J.M.W. Turner's uh, Venice San Giorgio uh, early morning and it's also reminiscent of, of a couple of Winslow Homer paintings a lot of his watercolors one in particular is called two men in a canoe um, you'll see the same kind of a day where this the sun is just starting to break through and we got a little bit of a fog um, and it's also very typical of watercolors Ted Kotsky's uh, harbor waterfront painting and those paintings all come to mind wherever I try to paint an effect like that we're only going to need a few colors today, but lots of water though. Uh, we're going to be basically uh, have light cool grays in the distance and we get progressively darker as we come forward to the foreground. So we're going to use more color, brighter colors up, in, up front, a very muted palette into the distance. And as usual, we're working from light to dark, from the background to the foreground in this particular painting. So. As always, I gotta get a big wash brush. I'm doing an 11 by 14, uh, 14 by uh, 10. It's a quarter sheet watercolor, so it's kind of small. It's gonna go fast. Gonna get the paper completely soaking wet. And I like to do this for a number of reasons. One, it gets my whole arm moving, cleans up any uh, dirt that I may have transferred from my hand onto the paper. Um, it breaks down some of the sizing in the watercolor paper. There's lots of reasons to do that. The main thing is it just gets my arm loosened up. Now I'm going to take a little bit of uh, Academy of Orange and a little red light and a lot of water. And I'll grab that color. We'll just pour it right on the paper. Just going to level off my table so it doesn't all pour over the desk. And we're going to roll that around. I'm also going to pour off some of the paint. You know, and looking at it, I could probably use a little bit more color. So let's grab a little bit more orange and a little bit more red light. Again, just pour it on. and then we'll roll it around. There we go. We'll recycle that color back on the palette. Okay, it's very wet. I'm gonna take some Windsor Blue Green Shade. It's a bluish green. And I'm gonna drop it all along the top edge of the paper You know, if you've seen me do a foggy thing in the past, if you've seen uh, a demonstration of mine either in person or on uh, YouTube, I've done fog. Uh, I, yeah, I'm using a, a lot less color than I am today. The, uh, in the other paintings, it's kind of heavy fog. My colors are just uh, Payne's gray, cobalt blue and ivory black. But today, because the sun's out, we're getting some uh, uh, more color in it, less gray. Okay. Now, where the uh, I want to get repeat some of those colors into the into the into the bay into the water. So I basically want what's happen happening up in here to basically happen down in here because it is like a mirror and it reflects on the water. So I'm going to grab some of the the uh, Windsor blue, but I do want some of that orange to remain. That's important too. That's the reflection of the light stuff into the water. If you look at the photographic reference, you can definitely see the warm color in that part of the painting. Now I'm going to work a long time now into the water. Uh, that's just the start color. I'm going to go a little darker in valley, especially as the water comes a little closer to us. Again, I'm pouring off the excess. 
you might find that you have to go back in with some of the blue. I can definitely see a couple spots in here that um, I wish there was more color from the reflection. So some of that uh, Windsor blue green shade. And then as you get down into this area, I'm going to pour a little bit of that excess off. Now as I get down into here, I can uh, get the color a little darker. And for that, we're going to add some cobalt blue to the mix and a little bit of RB black to mix our own paint gray. That's the cobalt blue right here. I can take even some of that Windsor green. Now I want my brush with more of a concentration of paint than I do water. So there's more paint in here than there is water. I'm going to hit that area down in here. And the reason for this, it might be the reflection of the sky. Uh, there's a progression in there. So this part of the sky is reflecting uh, a darker part of the sky that's directly above us. So that way that color is a little darker and it could be a little grayer as well. Okay, we're still not done yet. I'm going to do a couple more things. Um, one thing that I want to make sure I do, uh, this is going to dry shortly. <clears throat> and when it does, some of the water that's under the uh, bulldog clamps is going to back run and create a bloom on the paper. So I'm just going to take the uh, paper towel and wipe off some of that excess uh, water that's along the edge, including the bullnose clamp. Just get in here and just wipe up carefully along the edge so we don't get a back run and get a bloom on the page. You know, I, I work on big 300 pound paper and when I do, I tape it. I use regular uh, uh, masking tape that you can buy at the hardware store. Um, and I make sure that I just take, at this point, I just take my uh, tissue or paper towel and just clean up the edges on the uh, tape so I don't get the back one is there uh, as well. Okay. As long as it's wet, I can roll this thing around as much as I want. But the moment that this area starts to begin to dry, don't let any of that water go up there because there you get another bloom. <clears throat> okay, uh, I want that moment when the shine just begins to disappear. I'm going to take uh, some cobalt blue and some RV black and I'm going to work a couple ripples into the water. I'm also going to do um, into the distance behind the uh, boathouse that's over here on the on the left. There's a another gangway with some boats in the water. I'm going to wait. It's too wet right now to do this, but I'm going to wait a couple minutes when the shine just begins to disappear. I'm going to go back in there and hit some of those uh, areas where the uh, mist obscures our ability to see the uh, silhouette of the uh, of the object. And the other thing that I'm going to do, when water is still like that, there's still a little bit of an undulation every now and then, and it causes a ripple there. I want to get some texture onto the surface of the water, a couple uh, lines going across the page. Also, make note that I went over everything in my entire painting. The, what's going to eventually be a, a, a lobster boat, the dock, the little dory here and, and, and these things, I put a, a wash pad. I didn't stop my sky right on the edge of these objects. I went right over because I can because they're all going to be so much darker and layered on later. Okay. Let's help it along here. Hit the bottom edge. Get rid of that excess water. Don't use uh, the hair dryer. Just let it dry. Uh, with the prevailing humidity in your room. Because if you hit the hair dryer on it, you're going to get parts of the painting that are going to dry before you want to hit, hit an area. So we might be at that right stage right now to kind of hit a couple ripples into the water. So I got a little Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is the color we mix, cobalt blue and RB black. I don't want to add more paint to the page. I want to add uh, clean water. So making sure that I'm not adding more water to the page and I've got a, uh, and, and the timing is just right. It's not too wet. It's the, it's the moist stage of wetness. 
which means that the shine is just beginning to disappear. You can put these on a little bit of an angle. <clears throat> uh, don't put them as a bunch of straight horizontal lines going across the page. They get more level as they go into the distance back in here, but up close they have more of an angle on them depending on your vantage point. Now when, those, when these lines dry, they'll look like little ripples into the, into the water, which is a nice effect. Okay. Don't overdo it, it becomes too busy. Be careful of your spacing. Up close they can be um, uh, spaced a little further apart as they go into the distance, they get less in, numer uh, in number and they get closer together. Now I want to paint the area back in here where we see a gangway and a boat and I'm going to make it kind of a blurred out. I've extracted the water out of my brush. I've got Payne's Gray in it. There's the long gangway. It's an object that sort of resembles a boat in the distance. A couple pilings. It's uh, the, the boat's reflection. We could even put an, another boat way, way out into the fog. And it's just a, a long horizontal line. Again, extracting the water and we'll put a quick mast in. And you know what? I'm gonna put the boom in and then I'm gonna leave well enough alone. I think that's pretty good. And perhaps a reflection of the mast in the water. And then that'll be that for that area, actually for the whole for the whole painting right now. In the reference, you might notice that there's a little bit of a, a glare on the water. If you're daring and you've got the sky dark enough, what you could do is you can take a, a nice round brush with some water, but be really careful. You don't want to add a lot of water. You don't want to add any water on the paper. This is kind of like a damp sponge. And in the area where that highlight is going to be, see if you can lift that up almost down to the white of the paper. But again, if you hit a, a brush loaded with water in that spot, you'll get a real nasty looking bloom. You know, big, what it looks like a big stain on the paper, and it's not gonna add anything to your, uh, to your picture. In fact, it's, uh, it'll be a, a spot where people notice first, and they notice it not in a good way. All right, I was able to lift up a little bit of a white highlight out of that area. It's kind of nice. You can also do this at the end of the painting, either using, uh, uh, when it's a completely dry, you can just take a more abrasive brush and kind of scrub that edge out. Right on the top of our lobster boat, I'm going to pull a little white out of there as well. Maybe the deck is just getting hit with some of that sunlight. Um, you know what? I'm going to go uh, with well enough alone. The area was too wet in here, and this happens to you like it just did to me in this particular painting. I am actually going to go back because the ripples have completely vanished. They've equaled out. The water was too, uh, the paper was too wet in that area. So the paper's damp, and it can still work on it, provided I don't add a brush loaded with paint. Rather, let me, let me re say that a brush loaded with too much water. So now I've loaded up with more paint. And as always, I'm getting rid of the, uh, before I go into a, a damp sheet, I try to get in there and um, extract a lot of the excess water and I can restate a line in the water. There you go, nice dark line into the water. And as it dries out, it'll level out and we'll look at the uh, a, a nice uh, a ripple into the water. I probably a good time to hit the hair dryer on it. So, and remember when we dry, we uh, use a lower setting. And you move the hair dryer around on your paper. Don't concentrate the heat in one spot. You get the bloom or the stain on the page. And just keep moving the hair dryer around.
Now, if you think about it, we really are working from the background to the foreground. I've done the sky, I've done the distant water, some of the distant objects, and now it's the next, uh, it's the next layer, the next level. You can kind of think about it. I like to use this analogy. When I was a child, I had to do one of those uh, dioramas for my uh, my history class. Or I don't remember what it was, a geology, a geography class, and I had to do um, the uh, the desert. And in the background of my shoebox, and you probably made this when you were a kid too, was the sky and the distant mountains in the in the desert. And then the middle ground was a uh, uh, some cacti. And then there was another object that maybe a prairie dog or something in the in the foreground. So it was like three layers. Think about watercolor that way. You know, I have the, the background, which is what I just did. The second layer would be the middle ground. And then the final layer would be the the uh, the, the, the absolute foreground. Okay. I'm going to paint the boathouse. I'm going to mix up some Payne's gray, cobalt blue, and some ivory black. A lot of water. I don't want this to be too dark. Remember, it's far away. The atmosphere is uh, interfering with our ability to see stuff into the distance. It's making it lighter. It's making it grayer. It's, it's taking away all the all the uh, the light out. I'm actually going to switch up to a larger brush. I'm going to use a nice uh, three quarter flat, three quarter inch flat. Oh, you always test my colors out on the paper to, for value to make sure the value is okay before I go to the page. All right, and this boathouse is a little closer to us so it can be a little sh in more in sharp focus. I got another house in the front here, and um, that has a, a, some slight color into the roof. So while that paper's wet, I'm gonna grab a little red or whatever you wanna make it. But obviously don't make it too colorful, because it'll come forward. I don't want it to come forward. I'll throw a little red in there. Back to the Payne's Gray. And then down into the reflection. Whenever I do a water reflection, it's best to use one of these flat brushes. Load it up. Uh, present the brush like that. And just go make a back and forth stroke and put a little loop on it pitting the, uh, the reflection of the roof into the water. Once you get the knack of it, it's very easy to do a reflection and you can get better at it and make better shapes as you go, as you go forward. I didn't like all that uh, water accumulating along that part of the dock. So that's why I, I tilted it forward so it would go down to the reflection. Things reflect a little darker in the reflection and things that are very dark reflect a little lighter so I want the reflection down here to be um, a little darker I got a couple pilings over here uh, that's a nice uh, thing about having a nice brand new flat. You're able to make a, uh, uh, just hit the paper just down like that and you get a nice straight line. Reflection down in this part of the, of the uh, objects gets very, very dark. I'm going to take some uh, uh, cerulean blue coal, uh, ivory black.
and you can see I did a, a I'm pretty pleased with uh, how some of the valleys down here turned out it's considerably darker than up there you do want to make your reflection kind of look like the object that's up there um, you know did the best you can with that and of course there'd be a reflection of these pilings in the water okay that looks pretty good sometimes I just like to take uh, you know that papers almost uh, dry in that area and take a black you know some black something dark but again not too dark you know and there's a lot of water on the page right now so this will take the value down and a couple windows or but I'm gonna be very vague and understated I want to make that feel like that goes um, uh, you know, it's light and it goes way into the distance and I'm just gonna pour off some of that excess paint it's good there's a little buoy in the water and a little shot of color in that and paint its reflection okay. now I got my uh, my boats that I want to hit I'm gonna be around the same valley as the dock house so I can take what's ever uh, left over my palette. When you do an object uh, such as this, it's easy to make it uh, look sim too simplistic. I am intentionally putting little uh, bumps, edges in it, the more I make the object look uh, shapely, the better off I'm going to be, the more realistic the object will look. Okay, load up the brush with uh, the same color I was using a moment ago, but a little darker this time, a concentration of paint. Remember, it's the reflection, reflects the reflections reflect a little dark on the water. I'm going to paint it as if it's just a mirror image at first. But I want the bottom edges of the boat to look like a water reflection. So I'm taking this uh, flat brush and putting my uh, swiggle lines back and forth. And then at the right moment, there's usually a little line uh, on the boat on the bottom edge of the boat where it meets the water and I like to get a little color into that area sometimes it's red sometimes it's green I'm gonna make it red take a little cadmium red medium again extract some of the water out of the brush and just while the paper's wet just hit it a little red paint into those areas bleed it in looks like a nice watercolor effect all right and now I'm also going to put um, I'm gonna put another little boat back into the distance this is gonna be even lighter than the lobster boat so it's got way more water in the wash mast I'll make it a cat boat, which means that the mast is way forward of the boat. And the boom with the sail. And then, of course, the reflection in the water. and then the reflection of the mast. Okay, and then I got that little dory in the front. It seems like the stern, the back of the boat on this dory is much darker than the front part. But the the uh, bow is receiving a little bit more light, some of that breaking light right up in the front here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift off some paint in a moment, and I'm also gonna add some painting to the 
some more concentration of paint towards the stern. Doing the reflection now in the water. Lift off a little paint in the in the front of the boat, in the bow, and then towards the back. Put a little bit more heavy concentration of color into the back. Do the same thing into the to the reflection, but make sure it bl blends well. Look kind of weird if it just goes suddenly all to dark. Okay, so now I have the middle ground done. Uh, I have the, the the background done at first. And now I've got uh, uh, the middle ground boats, and now it's time to do the foreground dock. The top part of the pier is uh, catching a lot of uh, sky in it. It's, it is made up of uh, weathered wood, grayish wood. Good combination of colors for that. You can just use ivory black, and um, if, it's a, if it's a warm colored wood, you would add a warm color like orange or red or both, and you wind up with a warm gray, which I could probably use for a lot of the of, of this dock. Another combination is a cerulean blue. It does this basically the same thing, orange and, and red kind of make a, a grayish color, but I like to use a cerulean because it's, it, it's blue and it'll look cool for some of the cooler planes on the top part of the, of the, uh, of the dock, and it can be very dark in value in here. So I want the dock to actually go from this gray to even a cooler gray. That's cobalt. So it looks like it's uh, catching some of the sky in it. And we could be fairly dark in value to do this. I'm going to get even darker into the pilings, those poles that are support the dock. I'm going to go even darker in, in, in color and, and in value in that in a moment. And here's what I mean. So I got this color. You know, when I try to paint these shapes, uh, and do an old pier. I, I like to think of the again Ted Kautsky's work. He painted so much up in or any of those Rockport and Gloucester painters up there. They were so good at these harbors and decks. But I like Ted Kautsky especially um, uh, for this purpose. And I, uh, a particular painting of mine uh, that comes to uh, mind is his painting called Old Old Wharf. And I often take whenever I have a scene like this and I'm trying to to paint. I often take that painting out just to look at it, and it helps. Helps to, helps to inspire me to paint these uh, irregular shaped pilings. I notice that they tend to, they appear, I don't know if it's true or not, they appear to be wider up at the top. And as they go down into the water, they seem to get uh, more narrow. This is the shadow edge of the dock. It could be a little darker than the rest of the dock. And then as I go down into the, into the uh, pier and the pilings, it gets very, very dark underneath there. So don't be bashful with your darker value color. I like to use uh, ivory black, cerulean blue for those mixtures. They go down about halfway and then they become reflection. So keep that in mind too. So here's what I mean. So here's a piling. Right about at this point, right down in here, it meets the water. So now it becomes a reflection and I'm just gonna take uh, this is where we get to play abstract artist and really kind of mess around with some uh, just some fun uh, shape making as it's as it's as the piling goes down into the uh, into the water. Don't neglect some of these uh, diagonal beams. And about here is where it goes into the water. You got rocks, stuff floating on the water down in here. Try to vary your shape, be as shapely as you can. I think um, 
this is where I get the most enjoyment out of doing a scene like this. Because um, who is gonna who's gonna judge you on how well you put a piling in, or if you missed one? I said that once during the demo, and there's actually a guy in the uh, uh, in the audience who uh, worked and done pilings. <laughs> it was kind of an awkward moment, but kind of funny. In a piling where it meets the water, you break the shape up a little bit, kind of put it squig squiggly. I also like the fact that I can hit this, the dock up above is still very wet. And by the way, really love the, uh, how the, uh, the color blue turned out on the, uh, on the dock. Really does look like it's a sky plane on it, along with that little warmer gray. If I was to paint that all in the same color, all in the same value, uh, it would not uh, uh, be that good. It would, look, it would look more cartoonish, I suppose. More, more childlike and not uh, shapely. If uh, you got a diagonal going that way, it probably has a reflection going the same way. Here's the reflection of that diagonal in, in, uh, in there as well. And again, remember, don't be, uh, don't hold back on the value underneath these. These pilings are super dark. They're an underplane. They're not receiving much light. They are dark in nature. They're dark from sitting uh, in the water. They, they turn black over the years sediment that rests on it so there's a number of reasons why they're dark and you could be a little colorful as well I'm gonna put a little orange in this and red into this uh, into this mix we often when we deal with black and white you often look at it in terms of color temperature just don't assume black ivory black out of the tube is uh, definitely more neutral we make it cool by adding blue to it we make it warm by adding a warm color into it like orange or red And again, I got some stuff in the uh, in the foreground here. It might be rocks sitting in the in the water. Rocks in the water have a tendency to be roundish on the top, more level where where they sit in the water. Here's this, here's this rock's reflection. Make all kinds of sizes. Don't get stuck with the same size rock. I have a big size, I got a medium size, and I got a couple small ones here and there. The foreground uh, is probably filled with rocks, seaweed. So I actually added a little orange to this to this mix, this gray mix. Maybe it'll look like if I if I get enough color in there, if I, I'm gonna throw a little bit of my landscape green in here. There's all kinds of stuff floating on them. Seaweed, definitely greenish in color. My dock is still very, very much wet. So that when I put these pilings, they too will bleed, which is what I want it to do. After all, we're painting in watercolor and it should have those kinds of effects in it. And not only is it fun to do, as I like to say, um, I rather not only does it look cool, but it's also very fun to do uh, when they when the colors bleed just in the right way. I often say that, and uh, somebody in my classes will say, you know, uh, that happens for you, not for me. It's just, it turns out to be a bloody mess. Yeah, let's just that I've been painting a little longer, kind of know. Uh, I can anticipate and kind of know what is going to happen. I can look at a wash or, or wet paper and after all this time I can pretty much tell you if it's the right time to jump in or not.
but not always. All right, so here's another rock. Very dark in value. Got some local color green in it. Don't neglect the uh, don't neglect the diagonal pilings. Put them in as well. And right on that little spot there, there's a, uh, a, pi a pile of a lobster traps. Um, old enough to remember that they used to be made of wood Not anymore. They're all made out of a uh, fencing material made into a box and they're kind of greenish in color. So I'm going to grab um, uh, Some green I would like to do when I do these uh, modern-day um, Pots these lobster pots Is I like to take a whole bunch of quick lines going across like that That'll be one plane on the on the trap, and then a bunch going down like that. And you know what? They don't. That doesn't look so bad, right? And when this completely dries, I'll try to find a couple spots in here uh, to go even darker in value. Still make a couple of separations. Remember the the rest of the painting. This all area back in here is just basically done. It's just into the foreground where we're going to work some, you know, some additional darker values into the, into the ground and into the, to the front. And just one last post in there. Yeah, that's good. I just want to make one point. You know, I was reluctant in, uh, at first to, was I going to even do this particular subject, this particular, uh, re use this particular reference, because I, I thought it really divided a picture off in a, in a bad way, but it doesn't. I kind of compensated that by a couple of the pilings, and I think it helps, and I think it works. I was so intrigued by the shapes and the colors down in the pilings down here, and really eager to get into there and have some fun doing all that stuff. Oh, by the way, I don't like that little opening in here. There would be the reflection of the dock on that spot. But you know what it has done? When I, when I did my preliminary sketch, I noticed that the, you know, here's a, the viewer kind of sees this. They go to here. They meet up with that boat or they meet up with the light area in here. Snakes them back to there. There's actually this nice Z. And as we always do in our paintings, we try to thrust the viewer's eyes at least three times through the composition. Once, twice, and then the third. And that's a a Z or an S uh, kind of composition leading the eye always back uh, back into the painting um, that's a good thing to do so I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy this video it's a fairly easy painting to do please visit my website it's uh, watercolor pop p o p like my last name watercolorpop.com uh, please go there uh, you're able to leave me a tip I have a, a commerce page it's under uh, this uh, uh, a website page sub page called uh, paint with pop you'll see it when you land on the home page uh, I'll be very grateful if you can uh, leave me anything but no worries if you can't I just hope you uh, enjoyed this uh, this video remember to like it please subscribe to my channel on YouTube and sign up for my mail list and until next time stay well bye bye